I moved in these relatively conservative Catholic circles, which meant, OK, we're Orthodox, but it also means we believe in America and Ronald Reagan, and nuclear bombs and <laughs> invading folks and whatnot. You know, and I said, no, no. <laughs> Good everyone, my name is Mark Makivetsky, I'm with the Thomas More Centre and today is my pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Larry Chapp. Larry, uh, many of you will know from his articles in the Catholic World Report, National Catholic Register and other such places, uh, but he he's also the manager of the Dorothy Day Catholic Worker Farm with his wife Carmina, and so I thought it would be a interesting change of pace to get away from the th theological topics that you're probably most familiar with uh, in terms of what Larry covers and just to talk about more of his life on the farm. Uh, so welcome to the channel, Larry. Hey, thank you for having me, Mark. It's it's a great joy to be able to speak to a lot of the people there in Australia uh, that, that follow me. Hmm. And I, I'm actually speaking to you from Armadale, where there's a mini uh, renaissance of the Catholic land movement and uh, and Catholic economics. Uh, there's a, oh, there's people coalescing here uh, around that vision. So um, I think they'll be particularly interested in uh, hearing what you've got to say. So before we get into the uh, the life of the farm, I was wondering whether you could just tell us a bit about yourself. So, your, you know, your childhood education, your academic career uh, and your present situation. Oh, yeah, it's pretty simple. I mean, I, I grew up in the American heartland in, in the very middle of the United States in a state called Nebraska. Uh, I, it, it's an agricultural state, but I grew up in this in the capital city. And I, I just grew up a, a basic blue collar middle class kid in the 1960s. My father was a fireman. My mom was a stay at home mom. You get the picture. Mm -hmm. And we also shared the kind of Catholicism so prevalent in that post conciliar era, it was it was neither cultural Catholicism nor intentional committed Catholicism. It was some bizarre suburban creation of the of America and, and other. I'm assuming Australia as well, where so, yeah. Yeah, you, you, you go to church when the spirit moves you. But let's not take it all too seriously, shall we? Mm -hmm. Lest we become fanatics, that that kind of Catholicism that, that rubbed off on me. So, you know, I've got, I, you know, I've got that in my soul. That's why I can write about that and talk about that because mm -hmm. about beige Catholicism or whatever you want to call it, because I was so infected with it. Mm -hmm. Then as I grew older, I was like a precocious intellectual little bookish nerd kid. And I sort of read my way back into the faith. I had fallen away from the faith as a teenager. And then as I got older, I started reading and realized, oh, geez, this this has legs. And uh, long story short, I, uh, you know, I, I went to the seminary, thought I'd be a priest, decided, no, that's not for me, uh, and ended up getting a Ph.D. at Fordham University in New York City instead. I, I think I'd confused a vocation to the priesthood with a more academic vocation. Uh -huh. And so I discerned out of priesthood and, and one got the Ph.D., at Fordham University. And then I taught for 20 years immediately following at a small Catholic college in uh, northeastern Pennsylvania called DeSales University uh, and retired from there. And, and I met my wife there and, you know, raised a daughter and, uh, you know, I had a great time. It was fun, actually. And it was a very comfortable, cushy life. I got tenure, got promoted to full professor. I was publishing. I was giving lectures. I was, you know, I, I, I was the poster child of, you know, the professorate and all that and had a nice salary and a nice little cozy little house in the woods. And my wife and I took trips. And and so it was really she was, she's got a Ph.D. in theology, too. And uh, that's how we met. And and we both were very, very interested in the Catholic worker movement and Dorothy Day and her thought. And we were so we were teaching classes about the Catholic. And then we began to realize, you know, we talk the talk, but we don't walk the walk. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're we're living this cushy upper middle class suburban existence here. Uh, and then we're going into our classrooms and talking about Dorothy Day and the Catholic worker movement. And so we decided to start a Catholic worker farm. 
uh, and there were two elements, you know, in the Catholic worker movement. We can get into that later between the, the urban, more urban, and then the more rural. We chose the more rural. Okay. So in 2013, I, I retired early from teaching and we bought uh, about, and so it's a very, it's, it's a stretch to call it a farm. It's more like a, a big homestead. It's about 12, 13 acres maybe yeah i think around 12 acres mm -hmm. and uh well and i don't know in in hectares what that is uh yeah. so, <laughs> you know uh a hectare is bigger than an acre uh so you could i don't know maybe about 20 i, I don't know what they use in australia is it hectares is it acres, acres? but they they do when when there's a bushfire it's uh it's hectares so yeah it's big. yeah yeah yeah. Anyway, I, I'm, I have always have to be aware when I start talking about these things to non-American. I, I, I can't assume, you know, what a pound is or a foot is. No, we're <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, oh, it's like 20. Know. It's 20 feet. So, you know, I'm confused. When some, so that's that, he weighs 15 stone. And I'm what the hell is a three times three, roughly. That's how <laughs> yes, I'm, yeah. I don't know what any yeah. of that means. Yeah. We should have gone metric years ago. But anyway, we're about 11 acres, 12 acres. And uh and we, we, we got it's north. It's north of where we were. It's northwest of Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania, northeastern PA in the in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. And we have sheep. We have dairy goats. We have egg laying chickens. We've had pigs. We've had meat chickens, meat ducks. We grow food. And the idea is that we grow all of this and we give it away for free to various needy people. But more than that, we invite people to the farm and so on for very, but I know I don't want to get too far. Ahead. We're going to ask me a bunch of questions about all that, but that's yeah. sort of my life story, you know, just, and, and it's nothing exciting, nothing out of the ordinary, just mm -hmm. Midwestern American blue collar kid decides he wants to be a priest, then decides he wants to be a professor, then decides he wants to be a Catholic worker. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so here I am. Yeah, I like it though. I, I like the, the 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 desire for authenticity and to feel like no, we need to live more radically. Uh, I feel like we're all called to that, and it's uh, that's that's when we feel most alive. Is when that, we're that's the right word. That's the right mm -hmm. word. Mm -hmm. the, we felt called to live more radically, which is why mm -hmm. I like to describe myself. People these days call themselves radical traditionalists. Mm -hmm. I'm a traditional radical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm I'm a traditionalist radical mm -hmm. or a traditional radical, in, you know, and I so I, I turn it around. Yeah, and I think that's uh, I guess that that's what Dorothy Day was from my understanding of her. But um, I, I mean, I hadn't heard of Dorothy Day too much. I'd heard her bandied about, but I didn't know much of her thought or life. So I was hoping you could, uh, for those of who aren't familiar with her, um, or Peter Morin, I think that's pronunciation. Uh, yeah, you yeah, Peter Morin. Them and the Catholic worker movement, uh, what they hope to achieve through that. Yeah, that's another thing I have to remind myself of. You know, Dorothy Day and Peter Moore. Peter Moore was French, but he came to the United States. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're they're American people, and they're not even all that well known among Catholics, even in the United States. In most cases, mm -hmm. if you were to ask most average Catholics, what do you think of Dorothy Day in, in the United States? They'd say, mm -hmm. "Who, who? Yeah. Oh, they think Doris Day, the movie star, that's from right. way back yeah. when, right?" And certainly people in Europe and Australia and people like no, who's Dorothy Day? Well, who's Dorothy Day? Dorothy Day was a uh, she was raised Protestant, uh, you know, er, early 20th century. You know, I'm, you're talking 1910, 1920, you know, uh, mm -hmm. when she was young and she really was never that devout of a Christian at all, if, if anything. She got heavily involved in Marxist uh, labor agitation movements. She, her, her great desire was to be a journalist. And, and so, you know, she hung out in in these avant garde you know, bars in, in New York City and Chicago and places like that. And she would hang out with with literary figures and other journalists, probably smoking endless cigarettes and drinking the night away and, and a little bit sexually promiscuous. She knew the playwright Gene O'Neill. Uh, in New York City and so forth. And, but she was very, very keen on on the labor movement at a time. Remember, in the United States, uh, there were no such things as labor unions in like 1920. In fact, you were considered a communist if you agitated for labor unions. And there were famous uh, labor strikes that were broken up brutally by the by the American police and the American military and put down. And, and fortunately, in the United States, it was the Catholic Church to a great extent, because a lot of the people that were being put down were Catholic immigrants like the Irish. Uh, they were all in favor of the unions. And there was all the and then, of course, there were the papal social encyclicals from Leo the 13th going forward. 
Uh, but at that time, Dorothy Day was involved in the more the, just the Marxist labor agitation. Uh, but then she she has a child uh, with her sort of common law husband living on Staten Island of New York City. And, and she's she starts thinking more spiritually. She starts and she then she meets these nuns. Uh, she has her daughter baptized in the Catholic faith, and then she eventually gets baptized. In the, I'm really truncating things here. Yeah. Obviously, she went through a period of deep spiritual crisis and deep spiritual discernment. But all of that deep crisis and discernment she was reading all the time led her into the Catholic faith. And I think one of the things to understand about Dorothy Day is to understand that her pathway into the church, unlike so many other people, her pathway into the church was that she viewed the church as the church of the oppressed, the church of the poor, the mm -hmm. church of the working classes, at least on the level of its teaching. But then also she found here and there pockets of people within the Catholic church who were fighting for these things. And that was very attractive to her. Mm -hmm. And so she eventually converts to Catholicism. And uh, but she doesn't know, quite know what to do with all of that. And now she's alienated from all of her former Marxist friends who can't who think she's lost her mind. All right. So in, in the early 1930s, she meets Peter Morin. Peter Morin was just a French peasant, one of 24 kids, I do believe. Uh, he studied with the Christian brothers in France for many years, uh, decided not to pursue that, got drafted into the French military, fought in World War One. And then after the war was over, was being endlessly called back again and again and again and again because he was a reservist. So he decided to heck with that. And he fled France and went to Canada. Uh, and uh, he's, all this while he's reading, he's a bit of an autodidact. He's teaching himself more and more and more theology, philosophy, history and so forth. He eventually ends up in the United States and he's got all of these ideas. He was he was an idea guy and all these ideas in his head about how do we reform society and make it Catholic, make it deeply Catholic. What is a Catholic culture today? And he had what he was what he called his program, his ideas. So he he hooks up with Dorothy Day in New York City. Uh, it's a long story how they they sort of meet and so forth. Uh, and and he's in her apartment. He starts to regale her about theology and all these big ideas. And uh, she she's immediately she's mesmerized with his intellect. And so the two of them team up and create and start the Catholic worker movement uh, in the early 1930s, sort of at the height of the depression in the United States. And they started a newspaper simply called the Catholic worker that they sold for one cent on the street, one penny, which to this day, it still costs one penny. Uh, and the Catholic worker paper became the mouthpiece of this house of hospital. Dorothy opened these things called houses of hospitality that were soup kitchens, emergency shelters. They would take in anybody. It was Peter Morin's idea, too. And the idea here was simple. The universal cult to holiness that every single Catholic in the, you know, in the words of the famous words of the, the rascal Leon Bloy, uh, the, 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 the greatest tragedy in the life of any Catholic is not to be a saint. And that was Dorothy Day and Peter Morin's view, too. And so they believed in a time when holiness was considered the provenance of what Bishop Robert Barron calls the spiritual athletes of the church, the celibates, the monks, the nuns, the priests, they're the ones who can pursue holiness. The lay people, they should just be content with living out the basic rules, the basic commandments, the Ten Commandments. You, you abide by that and you go to heaven. But the call to perfection and to holiness was the reserve of the religious. And Dorothy Day and Peter Moore, well before their time, you know, hearkening back to the tradition of people like Francis de Sales said, no, holiness is meant for everybody. And so they started believing that it's, it's the task of every single Christian, lay or cleric, to live the Sermon on the Mount, which they then sought to put into action, especially, you know, its statements about, you know, going the extra mile, giving your cloak away, living, you know, living in poverty. And the story of the rich young ruler that Jesus says, you know, the gospel of Luke, give everything away if you want to be perfect. Mm -hmm. So they believe that, that the lay people should be able to live the counsels of poverty, chastity, and obedience, uh, according to their state in life. Chastity, of course, means something different for a priest than it does for a married couple. Mm -hmm. uh, for a priest, it means continence, no sex. For a married couple, chastity means, you know, to, to limit one's sexual expression within the teachings of the church. Uh, so 
you know, poverty, chastity, and obedience. And so that the, the Catholic worker movement was born. Mm-hmm. Very good. And so what what in particular, in a nutshell, uh, was it about Dorothy Day's life that was uh, particularly inspiring? Uh, what was it that you latched onto and, and found so attractive? Well, if I if I can be a little blunt and forward, mm-hmm. it's that she was a pain in the ass. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, seriously. She uh-huh. loved, by the way, she was a deeply Orthodox Catholic. When she converted, she became a very Orthodox kind of Catholic. Mm-hmm. She was no, I mean, and this is true of most converts, right? You don't convert to Catholicism because you think the church is full of it and you're sick of it. And you think the church should change its teachings on this and this and this and this. Now only cradle Catholics talk like that. Mm-hmm. Converts believe in the church and Dorothy did. And, and so did Peter Moran. And, and so this image of Dorothy day as this dissident Catholic, because she was a radical is false. So what attracted me to her is precisely this combination of orthodoxy and radical Catholicism, mm-hmm. because that's what I I'm I'm a thoroughly orthodox Catholic. Mm-hmm. And yet I always feel like coloring outside the lines. Mm-hmm. I'm not a status quo. Don't rock the boat kind of guy. I don't think that that's what orthodoxy demands. In fact, mm-hmm. I think and this is Dorothy Day's vision of what attracted me to her. If you are truly orthodox and you do a deep dive into your orthodoxy, Mm-hmm. then what you discover is the radicality of, of a Francis of Assisi, mm-hmm. okay? Or, or the radicality in the intellectual life, even of a Thomas Aquinas, or the radicality of a Teresa of Avila or a John of the Cross. What you discover is that the faith demands something radical from us mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and a way that the stodgy conservativism of certain kinds of conservative Catholics mm-hmm. just turns me off. It just leaves me cold. Uh-huh. And, and you know, and those were kind of the circles I moved in because I was an Orthodox Catholic. I moved in these relatively conservative Catholic circles, which meant, OK, we're Orthodox, but it also means we believe in America and Ronald Reagan, and nuclear bombs and <laughs> invading folks and whatnot. You know, and I said, no, no. Are you kidding me? Mm-hmm. No. You know, and so I discovered in Dorothy a kind of Catholicism that said, no, no, no. Actually, that's not Orthodoxy. That's something else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's one of those things. Even nowadays, here, it's it's you know, if you would frame it frame it as uh, someone into social justice, you know, but in, in a healthy sense, it's like mm-hmm. well, they're, they're a left wing Catholic, and then and then you got the doctrinally ortho, doctrinally orthodox, and they're the right wing Catholic, and you're thinking, yeah. well, you know, you've 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 cut them down right down the middle in terms of what a Catholic should be. Um, there there ought to be some um, blend of these two things for it to be. You're going to be judged on how you serve the poor, right? Not- yeah, you know it's funny, right? It, it, it's like these, it's like these categories become. It's like a package deal, all mm-hmm. right. If you're going to be a, if you're going to be a liberal Catholic, it means you've got to be X Y Z. If you're going to be a conservative Catholic, you're going to be X Y Z. Wait a minute, it's it's not, mm-hmm. it's not quite that that doctrinaire that simple. So mm-hmm. you're you're right, you know. If you're if you're going to be orthodox, there there's there's going to be some messiness in in how you make these divisions. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned you uh, you left orthodoxy because oh, no, not orthodoxy, my apology, academia, because you were uh, feeling too comfortable. So I suppose that's uh, yeah. that explains why you've moved out to Pennsylvania. Um, so I, I guess we'll move on to a discussion of the farm itself. And, and first yeah. of all, so what makes the Dorothy Day Catholic Worker Farm different from other farms? You've already kind of suggested you give your food away. <laughs> that's a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, part of it is, is it, yeah, it's, it's not, first off, it's, it's, it, the farm is not going to be for profit. It's not a mm-hmm. commercial enterprise mm-hmm. uh, and it's not meant to be. So you either have a source of outside income and my, my wife does uh, have a full-time job. Mm-hmm. Uh, she, she does online teaching, theology mm-hmm. teaching. Uh, you either have an outside source of income or you rely on donations. So that that's kind of, and we do both because my wife's income is very, 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 very meager. And I have a little meager income from freelance writing, Mm -hmm. but we don't make enough to make ends meet. So we do rely on donations. And that's the way most Catholic worker farms are too, because they're not commercial enterprises. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it's the number one obstacle. I often get people ask me, how do I start a Catholic worker farm? Well, you know, it's the number one obstacle, which is, money uh you know unless you're independently wealthy you're you're going to need some kind of a funding source Mm -hmm. to uh to to 
first buy the farm and then and then make make it work because you're not going to be making money off it. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing that kind of makes in a, a sort of farm into a Catholic worker farm is simply commitment to a set of ideals closely related to the ideas of Dorothy Day and Peter Morin. So, you know, it'd be strange if I started a Catholic worker farm and then dedicated myself to uh, building up the military industrial complex <laughs> of the United States. All right. That that would well, that would be a very strange Catholic worker farm says it would be totally contrary to the ideals of Dorothy Day and Peter Moore. So there's got to be some sort of theological commitment here mm -hmm. to a set of ideas that, that that you are then willing to communicate. Then the third thing is that it's a farm, you know, that that it has to I mean that it's not a commercial farm, but you're going to do agricultural things. I mean, that's the idea. It, uh, Peter Moore is really the genius behind the Catholic worker farms more than Dorothy Day. Dorothy Day was more about the urban stuff, although she loved the farms and would go to them. But Peter Morin had the agrarian vision. He talked about cult, culture and cultivation, that those three things kind of belonged together. And he was a sort of back to the land agrarianist and localist and anti-globalist long before those terms became sort of, you know, in the vogue. So you, as a Catholic worker farm, you're, you're committed to not only in not only living an agricultural life, but inculcating how to do those things in other people. So Peter Morin talked about the development of artisanal skills that go with agriculture. Uh, my wife, we have sheep, my, we shear them. Uh, my wife processes the wool. She teaches people how to spin wool into yarn and so on. We teach people how to can goods and you know how to grow food, how to raise animals. These are all lost artisanal skills. And, and the idea isn't simply to be a prepper or a survivalist. Peter Morin's idea was that there's spiritual value, spiritual merit uh, in learning these tactile artisanal skills, working the land. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there is a kind of Benedictine spirituality here of aura et labor. So my wife and I are Benedictine oblates. We have a small chapel here on our farm. Uh, we have the Eucharist reserved here uh, in, in the warm weather months, not in the winter, because the chapel's kind of shut down in the winter, it's so cold, uh, and it's not heated. Uh, but anyway, that's a long story. <laughs> uh, if we had enough money, we would we would build a new chapel and heat it, but, but we don't. But anyway, we do Liturgy of the Hours, morning prayer, midday prayer, vespers, evening prayer. Mm -hmm. uh, we do that very devotedly uh, throughout the year as part of, we're a part of our Benedictine spirituality. Dorothy Day was a Benedictine oblate. And when people come to the farm to visit, and so this is, this would be another aspect then of what makes it a Catholic worker farm is the virtue of hospitality, which is a very Benedictine virtue. It's a very Catholic worker virtue, which is we invite people to come here. And yes, they volunteer, they help us with the crops, they help us with the animals and so on. But 85% of what we do when people come here is we sit and we have conversation. We, 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 we have what I guess you would call fellowship. Mm -hmm. And we eat and we discuss, and then we do uh, liturgy of the hours in the chapel. And if they bring a priest with them, then we then we have mass. So that's the kind of rhythm of the farm here. And it sort of ebbs and flows. We're much busier spring, summer, fall. Winter is kind of a downtime. Uh, but and that's the way it is with most farms in temperate climates that don't have a, a year round mm. or year round sort of beautiful weather. Yeah. Too bad our farm's not in Florida or uh and someplace in australia Detroit. yes <laughs> yeah no it's a yeah it's i'm from queensland and it's great mangoes and all sorts of stuff you don't uh, there's no downtime in the weather um yeah so uh when you first uh decided you were going to embrace this idea when you got out to pennsylvania did you for a moment think you'd bitten off more than you could chew or was it fairly seamless and you just grew it very organically and slowly yeah i i really thought at first but people think because I was raised people in, in the United States who know where my home state of Nebraska is located, which is very rural. They just assumed, oh, you must have grown up on a farm. And I didn't. I didn't know anything about farming. Mm -hmm. In fact, my wife refers my her name, is by the way, is Carrie. Uh, she refers to me as the YouTube farmer because every every time I, I needed to know how to do something like how do I butcher a chicken? How do I shear mm -hmm. sheep? You know, how do I can tomatoes? I would just go on YouTube and, well, 
you know, the great university of YouTube would show me how to do those things. And, um, uh, and so I gradually just learned, um, trial and error. I did have a very wise friend though, former student of mine, an older woman, Lois miles is her name. She is a, a Protestant woman, a sort of a free church, uh, kind of a back to the land Protestant woman. Uh, but she, I asked her Lois, uh, what can, what advice can you give me about, about farming? And she goes, one big piece of advice. And it is this expect failure. <laughs> and, and I, at first was a little annoyed at that. Like, well, that's kind of, that's not a good send off to a dude that's looking for a little encouragement here about, you know, starting up a farm and whatnot, but she was absolutely prescient. You, you, you're so dependent on weather and things that you wouldn't, you think I see this is my mentality. You take a plant, you stick it in the ground, you wait for the rain to come. It grows. How how hard can that be? Well, it's hard. You anybody can grow weeds or anybody can grow grass. It's hard to grow produce because the soil has to be right. Our first year, we planted all these tomato plants, green pepper plants, barely got anything out of them. Barely got anything. 400 tomato plants. We got two tomatoes. Why? Because the soil wasn't any good. And these are things you have to learn. So that was a failure. But from that failure, we learned, oh, you have to compost. You have to amend the soil. You have to do all. You can't just plant something. And then, of course, it's weather dependent and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and, you know, so we did that. That that's that's that was a learning. It was a huge learning curve. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, so Peter Morin wrote that the Catholic worker believes in the establishment of farming communes where each one works according to his ability and gets according to his need. So it's a very attractive idea. I've been uh, kind of attracted to it myself, uh, and it has its roots in early Christianity, but I've seen a number mm -hmm. of kind of disasters uh, when people, I suppose, inspired by this ideal, not necessarily Christian, but this <coughs> ideal um, have gone and done that. Uh, so it's easier said than done. So do you think such expectations are realistic? Can they be achieved? Or is it... Um, is it that I, I, I think, oh, God, that is, that's the million dollar question, isn't it, Mark? I mean, that's the real question uh, you read in the book of Acts, for example, in the Acts of the Apostles, that you know, everybody held everything in common. Mm -hmm. Nobody owned anything. Everything. Everybody had every, and, you know, they basically shared what they needed and, and needed what they shared uh, eventually. And of course, the Marxists misuse this concept, you know, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. But Peter Morin was trying to co-opt the Marxist misuse of that phrase and to re to return it to its proper Christian foundation, mm -hmm. uh, that the Christian ideal is a kind of sense of the, the, the shared goods of this earth. Even Thomas Aquinas spoke about the fact that private property is not absolute. Right. And, and he, he believed that private property was a right, but it's not an absolute right. And he believed private property was a good thing, but not in an absolute sense. Why? Because Aquinas taught this doctrine called, you know, the, the universal destination of goods, which means that when God created this world, he created all the goods of this world to be shared and enjoyed by everyone, mm -hmm. uh, that there was no proprietary sense to any of it, uh, and, and, and that we're all, in a sense, owed the basic fundamental needs of life, and, and that we have an obligation and a charity to our brothers and sisters to provide that for them. So is it possible, you ask? I don't think it's possible given our current economic configurations. And by the way, some of your viewers might be aware of this fact. I mean, Dorothy Day has been accused of being a little sympathetic towards her former Marxist origins. No, she wasn't really at all. She rejected it root and branch. But one of the things I think that she did continue to have a soft spot in her heart for was the idea that at least the Marxists were attempting a real world, a real world version of this. Yeah. Okay? It was utopian. It was tyrannical. It was totalitarian. It was devoid of God. And maybe it was all of the former things because of the latter thing, the devoid of God. Mm -hmm. But she still thought this is the thing. She still thought it possible if, if there is a conversion of heart, Mm -hmm. what she called a revolution of the heart. 
she still thought it possible mm -hmm. that human beings are capable of living this way. Mm -hmm. Now, she didn't say this, but I would say this. I mean, if you look at, for example, tribal societies, uh, you know, modern people look at tribal societies and we refer to them as primitive, those primitive societies. They haven't evolved to the level of, you know, our civilization and stuff. And yet one of the one of the things about tribal societies is precisely the, the, the shared goods mm -hmm. of those things, the more egalitarian. Stuff. It's, it's one of the, you know, one of the great downsides. You see this, for example, in, even in the Old Testament, when the Jews are debating amongst themselves whether or not to go from a tribal confederation to a monarchic mm -hmm. system. And, and the big debate, you know, is they understood what they were giving up in order to have a king and a monarchy who can levy taxes and have a standing army and can beat the heck out of the Philistines. Mm -hmm. All right. That's why they needed a king, because they were getting the Bedeebers beat out of them by various people. Right. But they knew what they were giving up and God reluctantly gives them a king. This is this reluctantly because tribal society, everybody was equal under Yahweh. Everybody was equal under God. God was their king, and they were all his people. Mm -hmm. As soon as you have a real earthly king, then you get social stratification. Then you get greed. Then you get all of the attendant evils of that kind of civilization. And I think Dorothy Day looked at the scriptures, mm -hmm. and she sees the prophetic critique from Eli Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah of the excesses of the monarchy and a kind of hearkening back to those tribal society, the tribal stage of Israel. And, and I think Dorothy is saying early Christianity was a, in some sense an attempt to recover this. And why can't we now do it too? Mm -hmm. And you look here in Pennsylvania, we have the Amish, we have Mennonites, we have the Bruderhof communities that are a sort of an offshoot of that. Uh, the Bruderhof communities own everything in common and so on. Now they're an extreme minority mm -hmm. and yet they make it work. Uh -huh. uh, I wouldn't want to live on an Amish farm myself. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I do like taking an occasional plane flight and, uh -huh. you know, I, I, I you know, uh -huh. I do like certain amenities of modern technology, uh -huh. but I, th I think they prove that it's possible. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I think a lot of people, when they see, you know, they watch Harris, Harrison Ford and witness and they, they think, Oh, yeah, barn raising is, is wonderful. Um, and so there's even a, a fellow I've heard in Tasmania flew, be converted to a, to be Amish, learned the way of life, but then somehow flew back. Uh, he wouldn't he wouldn't have rode a boat. So um, but the I, Amish have their downside. Yeah, I, that's what I've heard. And so I was wondering um, to what extent does the uh, Amish approach to life differ from the vision of Peter Moore and, and the Dorothy Day Worker Farm? Well, I, I think a lot of it's theological. Obviously, they're they're sort of free church Protestant, and mm -hmm. and Dorothy Day and Peter Moore were were, were Catholics, uh, so I don't want to go into all the theological differences. Mm -hmm. uh, but I but I also think one of the differences is that Amish communities are are insular. They're they're inward looking. They're mm -hmm. they're uh, you know they 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 shun the outsider to a great extent. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of the point, whereas Catholic worker farms or Catholic worker houses of hospitality and the whole Catholic or movement is oriented towards going out into the world. Mm -hmm. it, it's not about retreating into a little enclave. And, and this is what I tell people all the time. We didn't start a Catholic worker farm in order to create a little Catholic compound mm -hmm. with buried school buses and hand grenades embossed with <laughs> the image of Our Lady of Fatima on them. Or what. And don't me wrong, I love Our Lady of Fatima. I'm just making fun of, of a certain kind of preppy sur prepper survivalist kind of Catholic compound idea that I'm repudiating here. That's, mm -hmm. that's not what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not the Catholic version of the Amish. The Amish are great in terms of shared possessions and agrarian vision of life, a simplicity of life, uh, all centered around prayer and worship of God. Great. Got that. But they are deeply insular. Mm -hmm. deeply deeply and also in their own way greedy uh <laughs> because they're very astute business people that's why i said there is a downside to, to the amish uh and and some of the amish and the, the offshoot the mennonites in in central pa some i don't know are, are known as notorious owners of puppy mills i don't know if you guys know what a puppy mill is a, a puppy mill in the united mm -hmm. states are people that 
that uh, breed dogs mm. for the simple purpose of create uh, purebred dogs, you know, all the all the various high end breeds. Mm -hmm. uh, and they breed them and breed them and breed them and breed in very cruel ways to just crank out puppy after puppy after puppy. And they keep the puppies in confined, horrible situations until they sell them for five, six, eight hundred dollars a pup. Uh, to unsuspecting people who don't realize they're now getting a highly inbred and neurotic and probably diseased animal. Mm. Uh, and, and so the state of Pennsylvania has taken measures against the, the puppy mills, uh, as they're called. Now, I, I, I don't want to belabor that point. And most Amish and Mennonites don't do that. Most yeah. don't. But my, my point, though, is that to, to point out the differences is that the reason why something like that can evolve out of those communities without a great deal of recrimination from within those communities is because they are very business oriented. They're money oriented. They're profit oriented. They are for profit enterprises. Mm -hmm. And that is very different from, from the Catholic worker okay. ethos. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, so Dorothy Day said that God meant things uh, to be much easier than we have made them. <laughs> I found that an interesting quote. Uh, would you mind elaborating on yeah. what you, you think that is? I think to a great extent, she got that from Peter Moran. Peter Moran said the goal of the church and the Catholic worker movement in particular was to help us create a society in which it's easier to be good. Full stop. Mm -hmm. Just to create a society in which it's easier to be good. And to that extent, we have to begin, he said, by creating a new society within the shell of the old. They're not about revolutions, you know, onto the barricades, you know, violence. It was a nonviolent pacifist movement, the Catholic worker movement. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they believed in a gradual organic change from below and from within through the creation of these small little counter resistance prophetic uh, communities that would then go out into the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and the goal was to create cultural situations in which impediments to moral goodness and holiness are simply removed. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and they believed that, you know, when God created, you know, even, even, even after we sinned, after we fell and, and life became more difficult, uh, I, God granted to human beings everything that they really needed in order to be happy, in order to return to him, in order to, 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 to you know, sort of roll back some of the effects of sin. Mm -hmm. But then we complicated that. I mean, is that once again, not to go back to the Old Testament, right? You get the story of the fall, but then the, the, the effects of the fall spill out until, you know, Noah's flood and all that stuff. <clears throat> right. And, and then God's got to sort of start again. And, and, and so you see this, this notion that human beings are constantly complicating things. We're constantly making it harder for ourselves. And yet it's really actually quite simple to be good. Mm -hmm. uh, but that it's a long and complicated, I think, <laughs> sociological story as to the nature of this complication. I think of French sociologist, uh, historian, no, sociologist like René Girard and his famous theory of uh, mimetic desire. Uh, by mimetic desire, mimesis, the Greek word for imitation, uh, Girard's theory, and although, I mean, he, Dorothy Day and Peter Morin would not have known about Girard, but it's very similar to this. His theory was that we grow to desire the things that we see other people desiring. So the essence of human, human growth is imitation. Mm -hmm. And if you create a culture and a society in which in which everything that we're told we're supposed to desire are all of these high end consumer goods and things like this, hmm. or that we're, that we are to desire the good of our nation. So you end up with nationalism and territorial disputes and war and all this, all of these desires are the result of a kind of competitive imitation of the desires of others. And you, they're jostling with each other. Mm -hmm. uh and 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 so juror i came up with the idea that we then developed the scapegoating mechanism where we scapegoat people who are the the enemies of, of our desires and what we seek and so i think this is very similar to what peter morn and dorothy day were saying about how we complicate things and why only the purging of our souls 
by living the life of evangelical counsels, following the gospel of Jesus Christ, the path of renunciation in Christ, to take up our cross, only then can we go through this, what we what the spiritual masters say is the first stage in the spiritual life, the purgative stage, mm. where we purge our memories and purge our desires of this false mimetic need to gain what other people have. Mm -hmm. And that's what they mean about it's it shouldn't be as complicated as is. We need to dial back this this mimesis, if you will. Yeah, there is. I have noticed uh, that it's not always just a, a tendency to uh, be attracted to worldly goodness, but but spiritual goodness. Mother Teresa, you know, she any any yeah. saint will magnetically draw yeah. people towards them. I experienced this. I went to volunteer in Calcutta uh, 18 years ago, and just did you? Wow! Being around the sisters, and uh, and I still light up when I see that sari. Um, and the, it, you know, you can put on the sari, and it doesn't mean you're a holy person. But but what I experienced with those sisters was something, and and there's a real desire to imitate. And I suppose if if there are more people like that around you, uh, they lift everyone else up uh, in in virtue. Um, That's true. So it's about replacing a false, false sense of imitation with mm. a true sense, you know. Mm. So if you surround yourself with saintly people, or at least aspire to be more like saintly people, mm. then it becomes much easier to be good. Mm. No, it's it's uh, there, there's something to it. Is it when it comes back to the authenticity? Oh yeah. It's, uh... I mean, it's isn't that just basic psychology 101 or human nature 101 mm. that if you surround yourself with good people, mm. it's going to be easier to be good. Absolutely. If you, you know, it's, it's really simple. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're somewhat harder to find nowadays, but you can find them true. That's a it's true. Uh, so just switching gears a bit. So you run a blog, Gaudium at Spurs22.com. Yes. Can you tell us what uh, motivated its creation and what you're hoping to achieve with it presently? Well, like I said, I retired from the professorate in 2013. But I always, you know, I've, like I said, I've always been an intellectually inclined person, despite my desire to do the farming, too. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a perfect Benedictine oblate in that sense. I combine the the contemplative dimension of prayer and reading and Lexia Divina and study of theology with the work. Mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't really have any major outlet for my intellectual side mm -hmm. other than occasional visitors and so forth. So about four years ago, I had some former students of mine who encouraged me, hey, chap, chap, you need to start a blog. You know, you've kissed the Blarney Stone. You can talk some talk. All right. So why don't you why don't you start a blog? Mm -hmm. And at first I resisted because I hate blogs. I still don't read them. I don't even read my own. And, <laughs> and, and seriously, because it's like, it's not the idea of a blog essay. It's just like there's 10 million of them. All right. There's a bazillion blogs. And I thought, who the heck is going to want to read my little scribblings? What a waste of time. Who cares? Because I still had this scholarly notion of, oh, I've got to be writing magnificent theology tomes of the deepest scholarship. Otherwise, I'm not going to write. Well, long story short. OK, so I start got him as best 22 and i'll explain the name in a second mm -hmm. a couple of short blog posts where i was critical of some prominent american hyper traditionalists like i said i'm very orthodox catholic but i i don't like the radical traditionalists very much mm -hmm. as we call them here i don't know what they call them in australia here in the united rad states trads, yeah mm -hmm. rad trads yeah and so I wrote some blog posts against them and then a few more blog posts against the progressive liberal nut jobs. Mm -hmm. And and then all of a sudden I discover that people are reading it and it's circulating around social media and it's hit a nerve. And then all of a sudden I get invited to give talks. I went on Bishop Robert Barron's Ward on Fire interview show, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and and I don't know, I'm people in Australia who Bishop Barron Award on Fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, I'm. Yeah. I don't want to make Australia sound like it's. In, you know, they, they're cut off from the world. <laughs> but also, I don't want to presume this. Um. You know, I don't want to be the ugly American. Just, well, enough. everybody knows what goes on in America, right? Uh -huh. So you know. Uh. St so good. Yeah. So you know, I've known Bob Bishop Barron, Bob Barron, for many, many, many years, and I went on his show, and then things really went viral. Mm -hmm. So basically, though, it was it was the result of me wanting to have a venue to simply write 
theological intellectual ideas. Mm -hmm. And but what uh, what's interesting is what I discovered is that there is a market out there because it went viral. It went big. There is a market out there for for average Catholics to read theology, real mm -hmm. theology, but that's written in a way that average people can kind of get their mind around. They might need to look up a word here and there because I do tend to use big words sometimes. All right. But people don't mind that, it seems. And 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 so, you know, what I try to do is I try to take big ideas and translate it into what an average educated Catholic who's interested in these things could understand. And it turns out there's a market for this. And I don't mean market in a, you know, crass sense mm -hmm. of making yeah. money. Yeah. I mean, there's a niche. Mm -hmm. There's a niche. And and people so, you know, and then I started a podcast and uh, and so on. And so here I am. And then I started writing for the National Catholic Reporter, the register, not, not the reporter, the register and mm -hmm. Catholic World Report. And I had a book published from Ignatius Press called Confession of a Catholic Worker. And, mm -hmm. you know, everything just went viral. I, I named the blog. It's a mouthful. I don't know if I should have renamed it something else. Gaudi Metzbez 22. Most of your viewers will know Gaudi Metzbez is the name of a Vatican II document the last document the council promulgated, the church in the modern world. It's a controversial document. It's actually one of my least favorite documents of Vatican II. JP uh, I think, favorite, I believe. I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the first half of the document is good. The second half reads like it was written by an entirely different committee, and I don't like it. Yeah. Uh, Hans Lewis von Balthasar said it, it reads a bit dilettantish and even joseph rotzinger pope benedict eventually said yeah i got some issues with it but nevertheless the high point of that document is in section 22 and scouting its best 22 mm -hmm. in a statement that i think is programmatic for everything we should be doing in modern theology it's only in the light of the word made flesh does the mystery of man take on meaning all right. And, and so, in other words, that's a Christological anthropology. Mm -hmm. That's a what that, that was that to me, the hermeneutical key for the entire council for all of the problems that ail the modern church, that the only way to understand humanity is to look at the sacred humanity of the God man, Jesus Christ. And so what we have today is a crisis of anthropology, a crisis in theological anthropology. And that line was, by the way, uh, coined by Henry de Lubac, or at least partly by Henry de Lubac, the great theologian, but it was championed and pushed into the document, helped to be pushed into the document by a young Polish bishop by the name of Karol Wojtyła. Uh, and that phrase in Gaudium et Spes 22 was near and dear to his heart. It's no accident that John Paul's first encyclical, Redemptor Hominis, the Redeemer of Man, was a Christological theological anthropology. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he thought that the great crisis of our time was an anthropological crisis. What does it mean to be human? Mm -hmm. What does it mean in our digital age? My friend Mark Stallman's always talking about we live in a digital paradigm, and that's going to be increasingly the question. What does it mean to be human? Mm -hmm. So that's really what my blog is about. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be human? And the answer given in Christological categories. Uh -huh. I was uh, reflecting on what attracted me to your blog and i think what what might attract others is is your your theological approach matches uh your approach that you illustrated earlier between orthodoxy and action uh, mm -hmm. you have this golden mean going on where uh you can critique both sides fairly and strongly and you you gain admirers because you can you can bridge that divide you're not you're not you know uh, mark I, I i appreciate you saying that and and that really energizes me to, and i like it when people say that because that's what i aimed for mm. but what it shows is i think that people like you like me people who think like us which are more than we realize i think mm -hmm. we're kind of rootless right what well, kind of what prompted the, the the whole blog thing was I'm trying to I'm trying to talk my way into where the heck do I belong in this church? Because, you know, right. I don't I'm not at all a progressive liberal. I, I, I loathe that kind of theology as a kind of institutional self-immolation suicide. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. But then the rad trad overreaction to that, I think, is equally crazy for reasons I won't go into. But then this it's not just. It's not just, well, I'm, I'm not left, I'm not right. I'm not entirely comfortable either with that neoconservative middle mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. position either, right? right? You know what I'm talking about? That yeah. that sort of, well, you know, there's modern political democracy, liberalism. It's yeah, very secular, but, but we can, yeah, you <laughs> yeah. know. So yeah. I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm obviously going to be post-liberal in some sense. And so I, I have no time for that whole conservative status quo, maintenance Catholicism, neoconservative, you know, masturbation is wrong, but owning nuclear bombs isn't uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> that kind of inconsistent mm-hmm. ethic drives me crazy. Mm-hmm. OK, uh, I even had a, a blog post called, you know, Eucharistic Incoherence. Because the big thing in the last American presidential election was, you know, Joe Biden's a Catholic and he's pro-abortion. So Mm -hmm. should he receive communion? And of course, everybody's saying no, no. And I don't think he should. But anyway, uh, you know, so then, but I but I wrote this blog post. Say, yeah, it's strange. Okay, we're we're really good on the abortion stuff and on the sex Mm -hmm. stuff and, you know, no fornication, no abortion. But we're okay with the young Catholic service dude of age 25 sitting in a Minuteman nuclear missile silo with that turnkey ready to go, ready to incinerate 10 million people. Mm -hmm. And he has the will and the intent to do so. Should that order come, in my opinion, that should be deemed grossly immoral, gravely immoral, as immoral as any sexual sin we would ever commit. Mm -hmm. And yet there he sits. There he sits in his nuclear silo, willing to do that, ready to do that. And the Catholic Church says nothing, nothing. OK, and, and that's the kind of, that's the kind of thing that doesn't sit well with me either. Mm-hmm. I shouldn't say the Catholic Church doesn't say anything. People have said things, yeah. uh, but but not enough, not loud enough. So that's why I started the blog, because I felt kind of rootless and homeless. Like mm-hmm. I'm, a, I'm a traditional radical, yes. not a radical traditionalist. I get that from Sister mm-hmm. Donald Corcoran. She's a Benedictine, a Com- a nun in the monastery that we're kind of attached to as, as oblates. Mm-hmm. And I, I just saw her last week and she said, Larry, you're not a traditional radical traditionalist. You're a traditional radical. Yeah. And, and so I think we've, been, I see, I think sister Donald has invented a whole new category. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think I, I totally see where you're coming from because the, the church and, and, you know, Catholics to an extent can still remain quite cozy with the culture and they pick and choose what they'll fight. And I think, well, no, I'm, I'm highly dissatisfied with the whole situation. And I feel like what well, the gospel needs to break out of these confines, um, you know, and so yeah. so, so a, a bit of uh, agitation here and there. This is why I think I like Dorothy Day as well from what I've read of her. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I like these people. I would recommend, yeah, I recommend people read her autobiography, The Long Loneliness, if they want to get introduced to her thought mm-hmm. it's it's still in print you can get it. it's really good yeah wonderful so finally i'll let you go because we're uh approaching an hour uh so i understand you are doing some fundraising uh so yes. uh, how can those people who are watching uh contribute to your work uh well you can go to my blog gaudium at spes 22.com and there's a donate button on there Mm-hmm. Uh, or and we are an official nonprofit in the United States, which means, you know, oh, I don't know what it's like in Australia <laughs> once again. But here in the United States, any donation to our farm is tax deductible. So I'll say that because uh, it's it's a charity. And uh, or you can just send a check if you don't want to go that route. You don't like putting your credit card information out there online. You can send a check and our address is there on the Web page as well. The Dorothy Day Catholic Worker make the check out to the Dorothy Day Catholic and what the fundraiser is. Like I said, we we don't make a lot of money. We don't make any money off the farm and we make very, very little money with our various for- sources of income. And we just reached a point where we want to actually it's not that we're going to go under, but we, we we're kind of on, on the on the cusp right now. right? And so we just decided, you know, let's swallow. We've never done this in 10 years. Mm-hmm. Let's swallow our pride. And let's ask for donations. I've had a donate button on my blog forever, but let's finally do an official fundraiser. Uh-huh. The fun and, and actually my blog and this whole ministry of writing and so forth is part of the, our nonprofit status. So any donation that would be made would help me to do things like pay, pay for the web domain, pay for the blogging platform, pay for the pod being podcast platform, the zoom platform, all of those things cost money, mm-hmm. money. I don't always have, but then also the farm needs. Uh, we, we are constantly in need of animal feed, grain, hay, uh, upgrades to some of the buildings that are falling apart 
that kind of thing, buying new little sheds and things for the dairy goats, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, upgrades to the chapel is, is, is on our agenda. I mentioned it has no heat, so we don't really use it much in the winter. Those are kinds of things. Very good. Right. And if I may give a little plug to my own channel uh, or our own channel, Thomas Moore Center, please share, like, and subscribe. We're just starting out. Uh, and so if you could spread this far and wide, that would be great. Dr. Larry Chap, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for the yeah, sharing your time with us. Uh, all the best for uh, your time uh, while you're fundraising and, uh, and for everything else that you're doing. God bless you. And, God uh, bless you, Mark. Thanks for having me on. On the internet. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you.